Bobby Heidelberg was called in on the federal grand jury. And he thought he'd actually ask some real questions. It was on the news. There were other bombs in the building. Witnesses said they'd seen feds in there planting bombs. It's all over the news there. He said, well, I think I'll ask some questions then. And over the last 50 years or so, they've turned juries, grand juries, in more and more to kept creatures who are told what to do. And that's not how the, how the Bill of Rights Constitution and our system of government works. And that's what jury nullification is about, is rediscovering that these citizen rule books that are mailed out free with uh, all of the orders at InfoWars.com break all that down for you. And we've had top constitutional law scholars on to break it down. But this is a short segment, long segment coming up. Hoppy Heidelberg and Chris Emery are our guests. So uh, you, you, you were getting to all the different you know, FBI coming, brandishing guns, and you said more threats came. Yes. I was told that if I... Uh filed a lawsuit that uh, everything would be forgiven. I, I could live. Everything would be fine if I didn't file a lawsuit. And as you'll recall, uh, Glenn Wilburn did file a lawsuit and did not survive. So it was not an empty threat. And uh, it didn't bother me a whole lot because he was, am I going to sue Caesar in Caesar's court? I mean, come on, I, I wasn't going to sue anybody. And uh, so that was the end of that threat. It didn't really amount to But they were still anything. scared of you calling witnesses and it being on record. Yeah, well, yeah, they were scared of anything, you know. And uh, then, you know, got the helicopter treatment later, but that's a, that's, that's a, Little different story. Well, I know you know as a, you know as a, you know uh, Western Southerner, you, you know, folks don't like to talk about things that have happened to them. But you've got to tell us the rest of the story um, of uh, what happened to you, the, the other forms of harassment. Because I've gotten the helicopter treatment, so has my family. Yeah. Well, they started flying three helicopters over my house uh, once a week, and they would circle my house very low until I came out and acknowledged their presence so they could go on. And uh, the message, I assume, was that we, we want you to know we know where you live. And any night we chose to, we could drop a bladder of gasoline on the roof in your house and shoot it with a flare and burn you and your family to death. That was the message. I understood the message. Um... I wasn't terribly worried about the message because people that do a lot of threatening aren't as likely to act as people who don't bother to threaten first. They just act. Yeah, because so I've said anybody who doesn't think of my family, there's not going to be any threats made. I will yeah. guarantee that. And, and, you know, what do they think is going to happen as they keep killing people and intimidating? Don't they know people are, are going to start responding back? I mean, we know where they're at as well. Well, yeah, but they have, they think they've got all the power because they've got the military might and they don't fear us because we, uh, as of yet, have not offered to resist uh, the way you have to. Well, that's because discretion is the greater part of valor, but the same yeah. thing happened for decades before 1776, Hoppy. Yeah, well, we're basically, we're in the same shape we were then. You know, uh, the, what the Crown was doing, sending out agents to uh, uh, eat out our substance uh, and all of that. That's exactly what's going on right now. I mean, the EPA, every government agency you can think of, their job is to eat out our substance. To break us, they're determined to destroy the middle class, and they're well on the way. When they double and triple the price of food and fuel, they've got you, because you can't do without either one, and... You're not going to have the money to do anything else. Even if you even if you have the money to afford food and fuel, you're not going to do anything else, and it's going to get to the point where you can't even afford. Uh, well, stay there, Hoppy. Long segment coming up. We'll get Chris Emery's take on this, and getting your testimony on records key. You're going to be back on the nightly news tonight, condensing it all down. We're going to come back and talk about. Uh, Glenn Wilburn and others straight ahead. Some of the folks that didn't make it. Terrence Yankee, you name it, straight ahead. Just joined us. Hoppy Heidelberg was a grand juror for the federal case in Oklahoma City, and they wouldn't call anybody connected to it. They wouldn't call all the witnesses that were on the news saying they saw feds at McVeigh planting gray sticks of butter. They wouldn't call Terrence Yankee and the other police that showed up minutes into it. 
Uh, they wouldn't call. The, I mean, the governor said they were there and saw bombs removed. I mean, we have all these newscasts. They're in the film, A Noble Lie. And he was trying to ask these questions, and he went to the judge, and the judge just said, you're off of this, you're gone, even though grand jurors are supposed to be running things, not the other way around. And then they had the FBI keep coming to his house and you know, opening their shirts up and showing him a firearm stuck in the, you know, the waistband, threatening him. And then helicopters flying around in his house you know, multiple times a week, uh, threats. And then he was told, don't file your lawsuit against us or you're going to end up dead. All will be forgiven. And then another gentleman did and ended up dead. Now, remember, cop of the year got killed. Other people got killed. I've talked, and we're going to try to get them on the show, police officers who've been threatened. Uh, Colonel Craig Roberts has talked about this, who was also a Tulsa police officer, Tulsa detective who they sent out there, um, separately an Army um, um, lieutenant colonel, and before that famous Marine Corps sniper who wrote a bunch of best-selling books on sniping. The point is, all of this went on. They even tried to set up Colonel Roberts a couple times uh, for all sorts of things, and we're investigating him for terrorism because he dared talk about this now years after he's off the tulsa police force they come to him and apologize uh but that's all a side issue craig roberts a lot of great characters up there in uh oklahoma marine corps sniper colonel in the army uh tulsa police department swat team leader helicopter pilot in fact one time the helicopter broke down over tulsa and he'll tell you the whole story of being an inch and a half shorter after the crash from his spine compressing but side issue going back to hoppy heidelberg all this is going on. Bring us up to how how were you given the message? You're saying shadowy figures, not FBI threatening you with guns now, that you're going to be dead if you file a lawsuit on us. Uh, tell us what the lawsuit was going to concern. I know we've talked about it over the years, but my memory's even foggy on this hoppy. And then, uh, you know, more about the helicopters, what they look like, and then uh, Mr. Wilburn and what happened to him. <clears throat> Well, the um, lost my train of thought. Ask me a question. Well, that was a lot of questions. Me well, 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 I mean, Stop uh, me with one. Let's get into the shadowy figures. Okay, this guy wasn't. He didn't have on a coat and tie. He had on Levi's and boots, but he was obviously not a cowboy. It turned out he was an attorney. I did a little homework later and found out who he was. He was an Oklahoma City attorney, and. Uh, he was trying to pretend to be my friend and my associate and be a cowboy and all of that. But uh, his approach, much lighter, much softer, no threats exactly, but his approach was way more serious than the guys that were trying to be bad. So I knew pretty much where the message was coming from. It didn't concern me because I didn't know, and I still don't know, that I had a lawsuit. Lawsuit for what? Sue the judge for kicking me off the jury? I don't know that that's not his. He didn't have the authority to do that. I don't know. What was the point of suing them? I, I wasn't going to sue, so I ignored it. It didn't bother me. I wasn't worried about it. And the helicopter thing didn't start till sometimes later. Before we finish, I want to do two points that come from General Parton. I don't have to do them right now, but there's two very important I'm going to write that down, uh, two points yeah. on Parton, and we two can also... Two points on Parton, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm going to write that down, but continuing with the threats, because that's evidence of the criminality, uh, but, but, but specifically, mm -hmm. was it like, I'm your friend, but you're not going to live if you go with this lawsuit. Everything will be forgiven, because you said that earlier. Well... He didn't, no, he was smooth. This guy was not, uh, he knew how to work it. He was good. That's why he, that's why he was sent. He was good. He was matter of fact. He was not threatening. Is a very nice, friendly tone of voice. Um, but that's what it, made it so creepy. Exactly. I, I knew exactly that this man was for real. He wasn't sent there to blow smoke or anything like that. He was just going to tell me exactly how it was going to be. And if I didn't like it, okay. It, it, it didn't really bother me. Uh, he was a nice guy. His threat was empty, not because they wouldn't do it. It was empty because I w had no interest in filing a lawsuit. Because I didn't have any, 
I didn't have anything in mind. I mean, what what was well, my there damages? was some type of suit they were concerned about, and we can talk about that later. Now, particularly with the helicopters, what do they look like? Unmarked? Well, yeah, they were unmarked. Uh, I've, I've heard all the stories about the black helicopter and everything, and I will admit that uh, up high against a blue sky, they were so dark they looked black. But they got down so low right in my yard, right around my house, that I that they were a very dark green is what they were. They weren't really black. They the mine. I, they, there are black helicopters, but mine were uh, a very dark green. Uh, helicopter. Yeah, so that's and, FEMA or, or an auxiliary of it. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know, but I could look directly, not directly, I mean, but they didn't get down so low they was going to crash, but I, I looked right at the pilots, you know. We had eye contact every time, and um, I don't know. They may have come when I wasn't there a time or two, and I didn't come out. I don't know that, but I know that the, all the times that I came out, they circled till I came out, and then once I waved them mm -hmm. off, they went on. Always three of them, Always came from the same direction, always left in the same direction. So, uh, now specifically, a, though, uh, tell us about the gentleman and who he was who did file a lawsuit. Oh, Glenn Wilburn was an accountant here in Oklahoma City, and he lost two grandchildren in the daycare center. And uh, he's pretty sharp. He was pretty sharp. He figured out right quick that this was all bogus. That you know nothing that government said could hold water. It is there was something wrong with it. So he went to investigating and he eventually got his daughter who had standing because it was her children that were killed, got his daughter to file a lawsuit against Tim McVeigh. <laughs> this is kinda odd, but what it did, it gave him the opportunity to uh pursue documents uh that they didn't want to give up nor did they want to say we don't want to give up. So it had the potential of being a problem. And uh, therefore, they knew that the girl would not pursue the lawsuit if they got rid of her dad. And so when they got rid of uh, Glenn, why the lawsuit went away. And then he went away too. And then he went, well, yeah, he went away first and then the lawsuit went away. How did he go away? I, I forget. Uh, cancer, pancreatic cancer. Yeah. That was one of the worst ways to pass away. Glenn passed on, uh, I believe, a day or two after the McVeigh trial, the federal trial verdict was read. And uh, Charles has an incredible story of how Glenn just literally couldn't stand up straight and was crying in Charles's arms. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, a few days before he passed on. And he wanted Charles to continue on because Glenn knew deep down inside that whoever murdered his grandkids were getting away literally with cold-blooded murder, and he didn't want that to happen. And they do, it's declassified, have those fast-acting cancers. That's, that's now been declassified. And there's been a lot of other deaths. Uh, what about Terrence Yankee? Well, Terrence Yankee, uh, as we uh, said last uh, Friday, uh, that he had passed on um, a year and three weeks after the bombing. It was on May 8, 1996. It was on a Tuesday. And um, he actually had turned, he was 30 years and six months old, uh, just a few days shy of that. Um, it, as, as you know, it, his death was, was horrible. Uh, he had gone out to retrieve some records at a, a storage locker. Coincidentally enough, he'd shared with uh, Dr. Uh, Charles Chumley, who passed away in a very suspicious plane accident in the fall of 1995. That's a whole other story for another time. We don't want to take up your, uh, your radio show. No, no, that. we can tell that, or we can tell it tonight. Yeah, he was helping investigate, too. Yes. In fact, uh, Dr. Chumley was Terry's back doctor. I mean, uh, it, it, like you said many times, uh, Alex, you couldn't make this up. The the people that cross paths, we're talking about one or two degree of separation with all of the key players in this investigation, not six or seven degrees. They were just once or two removed from knowing each other. I talked to Dr. Chumley's son about uh, three years ago. He would not talk to me in person, talked a few times on the phone, asked me not to call him back. He said he appreciated what we were doing on the film, but he really he didn't feel comfortable with pursuing any other information. That's how scared they had his son. Well, was, I, mean, I mean, here's the deal. At a certain point, if somebody killed my dad, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not making threats here. People are going to die. And I, I think America used to be like that, and so the system wouldn't act like this this much. But, uh, I mean... <laughs> What is it like for you guys living so close to it? Or what's it like watching Eric Holder on TV? I mean, let's talk about Eric Holder's role in all this.